Welcome everyone to another church service online. Uh, we thank you for joining us. Obviously, we love to be together in person, but we'll take this opportunity uh, that God has given to us. We want to remind you that uh, through these uh, this service, you'll be able to, to sing, and uh, you can even uh, chat it up on the chat board there with your thumbs, worship God with your thumbs, and, and say hello to folks, but give God uh, the praise as well. We'll also have the opportunity to fill out prayer cards, a connection card uh, that you could take advantage of. And, and the message as well. And you can interact with other people who are listening. Um, again, we thank God for you. We're praying for you. And so let's give God all the glory now um, as we spend some time together on Sunday. Hi, Crossroads. We're thankful to be gathering again um, virtually. Uh, it's a blessing to be able to um, worship the Lord together, uh, praise Him for His faithfulness and I'm going to read a couple verses from Lamentations chapter 3, and this is what they say. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And the word um, for love in these verses uh, means an unbreakable devotion to the promise. Uh, it means that we will never be cut off from a holy and loving and faithful God. And if you look at these verses, they're in the middle of a, um, a book that's about the destruction of Jerusalem and um, the, the famine and the, the, the terror that was going on around the time that these verses were written. It almost seems like it doesn't belong there, but it, it does belong there because the writer knew that no matter what was happening around him, that day after day after day, the Lord was going to be faithful that his mercy is new every day, that his promises to his children were true and trustworthy. So we know that he's faithful. And we know because of these verses and where they're put in the Bible that we will never be cut off from our faithful God. So this morning, keep that in mind as we're worshiping and praising him, just of, of, of that character quality that he is forever a faithful God.
God, that you are a faithful God. And I know that um, during difficult times, it is, uh, it is easy to, um, to doubt. It's easy to doubt. And, um, but we have to remember that our doubting or our unbelief has no bearing on his faithfulness. Um, 2 Timothy 2.13 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. So in the middle of our battles, uh, in the middle of uh, uh, doubts that creep in or, or our fears or our anxieties, our loneliness, he remains um, a faithful and forgiving father. That's just who he is. So there's no changing of who he is. There's no variation of what he's going to be each day. He is a faithful father. So let's take him at his word and praise him for his never-ending, never-changing faithfulness. In the middle of whatever it is that you're facing, he will remain faithful. So keep praising him.
wanted to sing in the middle of what we're experiencing and what we're going through and the, the fear and the doubt. It's good to sing and keep our minds set on, on who he is, what he's done for us. Um, you know, to, 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 to hear in that song that death is defeated and the king is alive and to, to really put that into perspective and realize the impossibility that he did. You know, he, 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 he has overcome death and the grave. Um, he has, his death gave us life. Think about that. And, you know, in the times where fear and anxiety might take over, just allow that to sink in. Think about the times that he has provided, even now, in the midst of whatever it is that we might individually be facing. Think of the fact that he's provided and woken us up every day, that we have a roof over our heads, that we're able to go and shop at the supermarket, um, that he meets our relational needs, he meets our health needs, and he is the provider of, of our lives, and that helps to just clarify in, in our minds who he is and his great faithfulness and that there is nothing he cannot do. So if you're praying and the mountain hasn't moved yet, don't stop praying because he's faithful. Look what he did. He defeated death and the king is alive. So let's trust in his faithfulness. Let's hang on to his faithfulness. Your promise still stands. Great is your faith. 
everyone to Crossroads. We're so glad that you're with us. Uh, we want to take this time just to share some important church announcements. Um, you may have already noticed, but um, the church is trying to make great efforts to keep people connected, whether it be through our prayer meetings or our groups and obviously our devotionals that come out each day. And so with that said, I just wanted to remind you that our women's ministry is meeting every other Friday. And if you're interested in that, you could email either Mary or Donna, um, and we'll have those emails flash for you. And then also our men's uh, ministry is meeting every Saturday. And if you're interested um, in gathering men, um, you can contact uh, Russ about that. And uh, we just want to just encourage everybody to remain connected to those groups and uh, your small groups as well and any prayer groups that you're a part of. Uh, those truly are the lifeblood of, of the church. And so take opportunity for that. I also want to remind uh, those with children that every Sunday we have our children's Sunday school that's online. And so we have age-appropriated lessons for the children. And so take advantage of that. Uh, keep the spiritual learning and encouragement going uh, for the kids. And we even tell you what scriptures to read. And I particularly like this because uh, it's giving you, the parent, the opportunity to instill these spiritual values in your child. It's obviously the church loves to do it. But really, when the church and the home is working in partnership together, uh, the child benefits greatly. And so we encourage you to take advantage of, of that opportunity. Also, every week, um, we tell you this, but you have the opportunity to get the daily devotion right to your email. It's also on the church app. And so it's the, our daily inspiration devotional. And so take advantage of that. We want to see you encouraged spiritually that way. We also have our video devotional that comes out um, each day on YouTube and social other areas of social media. And so all great ways uh, to remain uh, fed spiritually in addition to your own personal study. 
Also, I want to remind you of our prayer cards, and I have uh, one of them in my hand right now. Um, and it has this beautiful verse on here from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, where it tells us uh, to give thanks in all things and to pray without ceasing. And so go ahead and let us know about any prayer requests that you have. And then also uh, connection cards. If you're a guest watching for the first time or you've been uh, tuning in for a while, thank you. Uh, fill out that connection card and let us know you're here um, and, and just who, who else is connected with you that's watching. And finally, uh, we always thank you for the opportunity of giving. It is a blessing and a privilege to give, but especially now when there's uh, even more of a crunch going on in our country. And so uh, thanks be to God for all the financial blessings. And with that said, uh, I'm going to pray now, um, and you could either give online now or later, but we want to give God thanks nonetheless. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, uh, we thank you for uh, the musical worship that we just had and uh, the different ways that we can be connected, especially for our children. And now as we uh, receive this offering, God, whether it be now or later, we thank you, O oh God, for the gifts, and we thank you for the giver. Bless that which has been sacrificially given over to you. We commit these words of prayer in Christ's name. Amen.
generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you. promises of your word and we thank you that in these times we can pray to you for our our future lord and we can look forward to our 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 future and our hope because that's with you god lord we fix our eyes not on what is seen but what is unseen god we fix our eyes, our hearts, our minds on your faithfulness, God. How you've kept us, O oh Lord. 
You've sustained us and you have provided for us. And so, Lord, we, we seek you. We seek your word. We seek your will. We seek your way, oh, Lord, because it's higher than our way. So help us to trust and keep walking forward in trust. Be with us today as we dig into your word and search it and live like you want us to, oh Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hello, everyone. Uh, we want to welcome those who are watching across Facebook, YouTube, and our Crossroads Church app. Um, we also want to give a special greeting to our listening audience on AM 570 and FM 102.3. As we like to say, it's always a joy to be with you. We certainly do look forward to, though, uh, to being together, hopefully um, soon. Uh, but until then, uh, we're glad that we could share God's word with you today. Um, with that said, I, I want to talk with you about uh, this message series that we're going through on the Lord's Prayer. And we've been looking at the different principles that are associated with this special prayer that Jesus taught us. And today we want to talk with you about what we call the cooperation principle. Uh, what we need to know is, is that God wants to be in collaboration with us. He wants us to be in step with him. And so this is what the cooperation prayer principle is. It says this, pray in a way that invites God's assistance rather than his resistance. Again, think of prayer that way. That of course, we want God to assist us in what we're doing. We don't want his resistance. I heard the story uh, about a journalist who took out an ad for an upcoming research project he was going to do and then later report on. He wanted people who prayed uh, continuously to share with him how long they were praying and also their results. Well, a number of letters poured in and communication about it, and he whittled his list down to just two people. One was an older woman who prayed um, rigorously and prayed for her family and her church. She was a member of her church for over 40 years. She explained in her interview with the journalist that she had a specific place in her home that she prayed. And she described the chair as well as a table that had a book in it. And she recorded not only the prayer requests, but also the answers. And so then the journalist asked her, well, how many answered prayers have you witnessed in over four decades? And she said, so many, so many, and I've recorded all of them. Well, another person that he highlighted was a man who uh, did his praying, um, and he had his, himself a chair as well at home, uh, but he wasn't necessarily committed to church. In fact, uh, he ran around with a bad crowd for most of his life and uh, usually would get intoxicated on the weekends at the bar. And so the journalist said, well, could you tell me about uh, your prayers and how they've been answered? He goes, well, I've prayed a whole lot but I haven't gotten a whole lot of answers. Uh, God has been merciful to me, certainly, uh, but I haven't seen a lot of breakthrough. You know, who are you right now? Are you praying uh, and not getting any answers? Could it be that there is a way of life, a way that you're praying that's causing heaven uh, to stand back? Is your life in any way repelling the blessings of God? Now, I know uh, from times past in my own life, there's been times by the way I was living that I certainly was resisting the hand of God. But God's heart is that we would live a life and that we would pray in a way that is in cooperation with his will. And now when you dig in the Bible, uh, there's so many prayers and characters um, that sooner or later got it and they had this cooperative communication with God, this cooperative prayer talk with God. Here's just a few of them. I think of Abraham. God had said to Abraham that he was indeed going to make him a great nation. And Abraham's response to him, actually, it was a cooperative response. He trusted God. We're told that righteousness was accredited to him, and that he was even called the friend of God. See, when we have a cooperative relationship with God via prayer, we walk with God in a way of that of a good friend. I also think of Daniel's confession prayer in Daniel chapter 9. You might recall that Daniel went and prayed uh, for the people, and he was praying and asking for God's forgiveness. Well, guess what that cooperative prayer did, that confession prayer did? 
It opened up Daniel to receive a vision from God that has a lot to do with the events of the second coming of Christ going even into the tribulation. And so uh, God gave him that. And I think God wants to do that in our life. I think as we have a confession, an honest confession before God, for ourselves, for others, and we're interceding, uh, God is going to give us uh, visions of his word, uh, visions of of what he desires for you and I. He's going to certainly bless us like he did Abraham. I also think of Elijah's selfless prayer. Remember when he went and he prayed uh, for the widow's son who had died? And he stretched himself upon the son and asked that God would deliver uh, this boy, and God answered. Uh, We find it out in 1 Kings 17. Uh, God uh, answered that cooperative prayer with healing. And then, of course, the Lord's Prayer that we've been chronicling. Jesus prayed uh, the model prayer, um, and God approves of it, and God has left it and preserved it in the Scriptures for you and I. Again, not for it to be a formula or a ritual, but for it to be the very framework, the very foundation, the very structure of our cooperative prayers with God. And so I want to invite you now to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6 as we're continuing our journey through the Lord's Prayer. Starting in verse 10, and we're going to look at verse 10 and then some adjoining verses. It starts off by saying this. Um, You're familiar with this. If you had a lot of penance like me growing up, you've prayed the Our Father a lot. Uh, But your kingdom come. Uh, Very important. Your kingdom come, this first part of the verse. Now, you want to circle your, obviously, it's in reference to God. It's God's kingdom, not my kingdom, not a denomination's kingdom, uh, not a, a political kingdom. It's God's kingdom. That's whose kingdom we're talking about here, just so we know. But what, what about God's kingdom? Um, is it, what is it referencing exactly? Well, it's important to understand what Jesus means here when, he's, when he says that we're to pray for God's kingdom to come. Well, what is God's kingdom? Is that necessarily talking about a physical structure. It's talking about the realm, first and foremost, and you might want to jot this down somewhere, but of salvation, that God's kingdom is about salvation. Uh, For your kingdom to come, essentially we're praying for God's kingdom to grow, and God's kingdom grows not by brick and mortar or by land, indeed, it grows by more and more people coming to Christ. And so when we pray your kingdom come, we're praying for more and more people to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And so right here, you would have what you might call a family prayer every day. Lord, let your kingdom come under my roof for my sons or my daughters, my spouse, uh, my parents, my grandparents, my friends, whoever it might be. You are praying for God's kingdom to come in your family. You're essentially praying for those who don't know Christ to come to Christ. It's the best prayer you could pray for your family. Also to pray your kingdom come is to also pray for people to grow spiritually. And this could apply to your own life. You could say, God, let your kingdom come in my own life. Let me grow more in the knowledge of your kingdom. Help me to seek first your kingdom, your rule for my life, your way for my life, that this is the mindset that we need to have. And then, of course, your kingdom come. Not only does it mean salvation, not only does it mean our own spiritual growth, But your kingdom come refers to God's rule after the rapture, then the tribulation, and then the second coming. And we have uh, the the 1,000-year reign of Christ, and then he defeats the devil once and for all. God's kingdom to come, the full extravagant event of the second coming of Christ. And so we should be praying, Lord, end this evil, end the reign of terror, end the reign of the devil, end all of it, oh God. Let your kingdom come. Bring salvation. Help me to grow. Help my church to grow spiritually. Help those I love, those I know to grow, Lord. And and Lord, I pray, I pray for the events of your second coming to unfold. And so this is a beautiful word here, the kingdom. Notice it's not my kingdom, Lord. Let me become, you know, smarter. Although there's nothing wrong with praying that. That's not what this is. That's the next part. Pray, you know, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. You might need more wisdom in an area. Lord, help me on the job. You might need help getting a job. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what this is. Your kingdom come is not about my kingdom coming, not about you and I coming in the money or hitting the lotto or anything. It's about God's kingdom plan and his purposes. When we pray like that, what we're doing is we are inviting God's assistance. 
We're inviting God to assist us in reaching our family. We're inviting God's assistance on growing spiritually. We're inviting God and his plan to unfold in this world. Listen, God, it makes very clear in his word that his mind is changed by our prayer. We're gonna see that in just a moment, but uh, before we get to that example, uh, a biblical point emerges here that we have to underline and underscore if we're gonna be in cooperation with God, and it's this. We need to get on the same page with God. And you might wanna jot that down somewhere. I gotta get on the same page with God. I can't be doing my thing and expect God to bless it. I got to live my life in such a way that it is inviting the support, the endorsement, and the assistance of Almighty God. I can't be living a lifestyle. I can't have one foot in church and one foot in the world. God loves me so much that he wants to bless me more than I even can begin to pray about. But I know that that comes by way of me being in cooperation with God. I vertically have to be right with God. I can't be on my own path sowing my own seed. I need to live a life that's in concert. I need to get on the same page as God. Now, perhaps one of the best characters to illustrate this is Jonah. You remember the story of Jonah, right? And I I was chronicling his book, his four-chapter book, and you know what the story of Jonah is, really? It's about getting on the same page with God. That's what it is. Because you might recall, look what here in your notes, in Jonah chapter 1, Verse four, we're told that God gave Jonah certain directions to go to Nineveh to preach a message of salvation, to expand the kingdom. But Jonah went his own way. Look what it says here in Jonah 1.4. But Jonah got up and went the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Now, before we go any further, can anybody relate to that? How many times has God told you to do something and you went, notice this, in the opposite direction? Maybe God's been inviting you to church for years, but you've been going in the opposite direction. Uh, Maybe God has been laying on your heart to serve him like Jonah, but you've been going in the opposite direction. Maybe God has been putting ideas in your mind to expand your business, to expand your education, because why? He wants to use you because he's going to bless you to be a blessing. But guess what? You've been going in the opposite direction. You know what that's called? That's called being on the opposite page of God. So God wants to get Jonah on the right page. And it goes on to say this, that Jonah went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving to Tarshish. He bought a ticket online. No, he didn't buy it online, but he bought a ticket. He went on board hoping, notice this, hoping to escape from the Lord and then sailing to Tarshish. He was hoping to escape from God's page. Here's the thing that uh, that we know to be certain. You can't escape God's plan. One way or the other, God is going to get you. He's going to get you on the same page. Now, it's better if we just go willingly and not like Jonah. But God will, because he loves us, will get us to a point uh, when we say oinkle and we have to get on his page. And what does God do in Jonah chapter 1? God brings a storm. That same ship that Jonah was on happened to be in the pathway of a terrible storm. And this storm ravaged the sea so much that the other shipmates that were on there, they asked, you know, who angered their God to allow this? That's how bad the storm was. They saw it as a supernatural event. And now at the time, you could tell the shipmates uh, weren't believers, but they had enough gumption to say somebody must have angered their God. Well, Jonah explained to them earlier that he was running from God. And then Jonah then came and said, this great storm is because of me. They tried to go against the storm, but it didn't work. And then eventually they threw Jonah over the top. The storm ceased. Those men who were his shipmates, who weren't on God's page, guess what happened to them? Then they started to believe in God. They got on God's page. But Jonah wasn't on God's page yet until a whale came and got him. And Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Now, I've heard some people go, oh, how could a whale possibly swallow a human? Well, whales are big, in case you haven't noticed. Benjamin and I, the other day, were studying whales, and we were coming and talking about the, this, this, the great blue whale. And this whale is the size of perhaps certain standard properties here in Staten Island, 40 by 100 lots over 45 tons in weight. Uh, I think a whale could swallow a human being with no problem. 
And just to give you an idea, you could swallow, like when you're riding your bike and you have your mouth open and a bug goes in your mouth, you swallow the bug. You didn't necessarily bite the bug, but you're so big in proportion to the bug that that bug goes right in your mouth and you swallow it without ever chewing on it and you don't realize it till it's going down. I would suppose that on a greater scale, that's how it is with the whale. He didn't even know he swallowed this human being at first, perhaps. But however it happened, listen, God created the whale and he created the whale's mouth. And if God wants a whale to swallow Jonah to get him on the same page, he could do that. And so that's exactly what happens. The whale swallows Jonah. And then in chapter two, Jonah then is praying to God and he's asking for God's mercy to be upon him. And then Jonah, guess what? He goes to Nineveh. He goes to Nineveh to bring the word of God there. And in Jonah chapter two, verse one, it says, I cried out to the Lord, Jonah said, in my great trouble, and he answered me. Next, we find in chapter three, the completion of this prayer. It tells us that Jonah went to Nineveh. In Jonah 3, 3, it says the time, this time, now notice this time, because last time Jonah wasn't on the same page of God. It says Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh and a city so large that it took three days to see it all. He was in the belly of the whale for three days and he was in the city for three days, uh, reminiscent of um, Jesus being in the grave for three days. But nevertheless, uh, Jonah is on the same page with God. We got to get on the same page with God. And then you might recall Nineveh, where he went at first, that was a pagan area. But what happens? Jonah brings the message, and then the king puts out a decree that everybody's got to pray to God. Guess what happened there? The king got on the same page with God. So you got Jonah who got on the same page with God. You got his shipmates who got on the same page with God. Now you got the king of Nineveh who's got on the same page with God. But then something happens. Jonah in chapter four complains to God because God was originally, God was going to bring wrath upon Nineveh. But the Bible says because the king sought God, because the king got on the same page with God, God changed his mind, the Bible says. And God extended mercy. Jonah was upset about it. Jonah said, how come you didn't bring judgment? He started to complain. And then God had to get Jonah back on the same page with him. Jonah said, God explained to him, if I could take care of you, why can't I take care of them? And so what we see is everybody get on the same page here, but God wants you and I to know today that, you know, if you're hearing this right now, you know, maybe your mother, your father, your spouse has this on in the background and you can't wait for this loudmouth me to get done. But you know what? You need to hear this. You need to get on the same page with God. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for some terrible tragedy to wake you up? Are you waiting to lose everything then to realize that God is all you need, all you need to have? Get on the same page with God. You know, let's think about that for a second. God wants us to get on the same page with him and he will use anything to bring it about. You know, I jotted down a few areas where when we pray, how sometimes it sounds when we're not on the same page with God. Sometimes we pray like this, Lord, give me an easy peasy day. Have you ever prayed that? You know, that's what we say on our page. You know what it says on God's page? I will give you strength that you thought you never could have. Our page says, Lord, please let me hit the jackpot, the mega million in the lottery. And God says this, I will provide for all of your needs according to my riches in heaven. That's God's page. Our page says, Lord, uh, help me to pass this test I didn't study for. God's page says, diligence and hard work I shall reward. Our page says, God, I just want to have all that I could have now. God, I want to live in pleasure. I want to have it now, even if it goes against your word. And God's page says, I will bless you greater than you could ever realize. Uh, Our page says, I don't want to go to church today. It's raining. God's page says, do not forsake the assembly of believers. Our page says, I want to complain God's page says we need to contribute. Our page says, oh God, I want to do it my way. God's page says, I want to give you an abundant life when you do it my way. There's a difference. And that is God's kingdom. God's kingdom isn't just a bunch of talk. You know, a lot of people give a lot of lip service to God, but they're not walking the talk. We want to know that the kingdom of God is powerful. That when we are on the same 
page as God. And if he needs to use a whale to get our attention, he'll do it. The power that comes from the kingdom plan of God is like no other. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It is living in God's power. That's what you and I need to hope for and trust in. We want to live in God's power. Your kingdom come. God, I don't, I don't want to be on any other page but your page. We got to get on the same page with God. Now, notice the next part of Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. So your kingdom come next, your will be done on earth. Now, the will of God, the will of God is his sovereign, holy plan. That's what it is. That's the best way to understand it. The will of God is that. A lot of times people go, I gotta, I'm praying for the will of God. Well, the will of God is revealed in his word. Um, and then specifically to our life, we could apply God's word and his wisdom there and also uh, seek God for guidance and direction. But usually when we pray this, we pray this a, a number of different ways. Some people pray your will be done with some resentment. Uh, all right, God, I... Let your will be done, even though I don't agree with it. Well, that's not how we need to pray. Some people pray with resignation. Oh, God, let your will's gonna be done anyway. It really doesn't matter if I pray anyway. Well, God doesn't want us to pray that way. Some people pray with regret. Well, my life would be a lot more happier if I did it my way instead of this way. This is the hard way. That's not how God wants you to pray. God wants us to pray your will be done with a, a sense of renewal a sense of rejoicing, a sense of refocusing on God Almighty. Your will be done on earth. So God, let your will be done right in my life right now. On earth means your home, your family, your heart, your mind. That that's where it needs to be. Now, this has to involve your will to be done. For us to understand this, this is not just a a mystical thought. It's something that involves the need for a changing of our thinking. So you might want to jot this principle down. If I'm going to be in cooperation with God, not only do I need to get on the same page with God, I need to change my thinking from convenience to obedience. And you might just want to say that. I got to change my thinking from convenience to obedience. A lot of times we base our walk with God based on convenience, but that's not how God wants us to live. We usually only take steps with God if it's convenient. Up, it's raining out. I can't go to church today. Up, something better came up. I can't do this. I can't pray. I got. And we don't want to live our life that way. We don't want to be people who just define our relationship with Christ on convenience. That is not going to invite the assistance of God. But what is going to invite the assistance of God is when we live disobedient, trusting life. Remember Noah in the book of Genesis 6.22? It tells us that Noah did, notice here, everything exactly as God had commanded him. Now, that statement is loaded because from the time we hear about Noah to this point, he's building the ark. And calculations say that it took over 100 years to build the ark. So for over 100 years, Noah was building a boat because a a rain was coming that had never rained before. God irrigated the ground uh, from the ground up. It had never rained before as we know rain to be. And so to build an ark for a rainstorm is ridiculous. But Noah nevertheless listened and obeyed God. And there was a lot of materials, measurements that were associated with building this ark. And Moses um, just Moses is a great example of obedience as well with leading the people to the mouth of the Red Sea. But prior to that, you see Noah doing the same thing, being obedient unto God, even when it doesn't, makes sense. And we see this Abraham, the same thing. God will bless you and I. He will assist you and I when we are willing to trust him. Now, one of the great stories of this also has to do with water and the crossing of another body of water, um, and that is the Jordan River. In the book of Joshua, chapter 3, verse 14 through 15, we find out that finally, um, the nation Israel had was really on the doorstep of the promised land. And what stood between them and the promised land ultimately was this famous body of water known as the Jordan River. Now, we know from uh, archaeological study as well as the book of Jeremiah 
that surrounding uh, where they were um, under the sea there was a lot of undergrowth. And maybe you've been in oceans at times and there was a lot of undergrowth where you're stepping in the ocean. You can't see it, but you're stepping on seaweed and rock and, and w- we would call weeds if it wasn't under the water. And so uh, we were told in the book of Jeremiah that there was a lot of undergrowth around. We also know that the particular time of the year, which was the harvest time, uh, that, that there was a, a current and with the wind that it could, it, it was just tremendous. The water was anywhere from three to 12 feet deep. Um, and the water was that they find out was basically uncrossable. What were they to do? And so they had pitched their tents. There was a thou- hundreds of thousands of people. How were they going to get to the promised land? And so what had happened was they pitched their tent. They were there for three days. And then God uh, explained to Joshua and the leaders, um, take the Ark of the Covenant and go ahead. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was this elaborate piece of furniture that housed three very important items to the people of Israel. One was the Ten Commandments. The two tablets was there. That was in the Ark of the Covenant. Also, we have a pot of manna that is in the Ark of the Covenant, symbolizing God's past provisions. Also, you have Aaron's old rod that uh, helped with the, with, the, with the tree, with the leaves and the almonds, uh, symbolizing, again, God's sovereign ability to provide. But not only that, on top of the Ark of the Covenant was a, was a gold plate. And this gold plate was known as the mercy seat. And there the mercy seat symbolized God's presence and how God extends mercy. And so God said, let the, carry the Ark of the Covenant ahead of the people. Let them stand at a certain distance, but let it go ahead. You know what that was symbolizing? That God was gonna go ahead of them into the sea. But this is what God did here. Now let's pick it up here in Joshua 3, 14 through 16. It says, Some, so the people left their camp to cross the Jordan and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. It was the harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priest who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, notice this, the water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed to the Dead Sea until the river bed, listen to this, was dry. God did it again. And then all the people, that's the women, the children, the infants, crossed over near the town of Jericho. See what happens when you obey God? You know, God takes a no way and he makes it a highway. What no way, quote unquote, do you have in your life right now? There's no way he's going to get saved. There's no way I'm going to open up this job or this business. There's no way I'm going to get this degree. There's no way I'm going to meet this person. There's no way I'm going to do this. You know what? Take that no way and realize that God wants to use it to make a highway. God specializes in the impossible. See, when you and I live a cooperative life with God, we're inviting his assistance to help us cross the Jordan. How many of us right now who are listening uh, to this message and watching this, we have our own Jordan right now that seems impassable. Uh, We have our own situations right now and we're staring at it and we're going, how in the world is this gonna work? Don't worry, God is gonna make a way. He is the way maker. God will make a way where there is no way. Here's the thing, we gotta change our thinking. Stop feeding the negativity. Oh, it's never going to happen. Maybe somebody spoke that over you years ago. Oh, they're never going to do this, and they're never going to do that. Here's the thing. Remember this. Uh, somebody taught me this years ago. God is the, is the majority. He's got the final say. You are God's child. He is your heavenly father. The same way that he parted the Red Sea, the same way that he, he opened up the Jordan here and made it a dry ground, God is going to make a way for you. Our responsibility is to choose obedience. See, notice what happened first. Once their feet hit the water, then the miracle started to happen. See, God's not going to bring the miracle if we're way off on the side and we're waiting for him to do it. Oh, he can do it. But he's, he's waiting to see you and I step forward. You got to get your feet wet. And maybe today getting your feet wet means you're going to confess your heart over to God. Because as we talked about like Jonah earlier, you've been running. 
Maybe that's how you get your feet wet. Maybe for some of you, it's, it's like Jonah. It's, it's here with Joshua realizing your calling because after that, God went and told Joshua, oh boy, the people are going to know that you're my man. You know, God has a calling on your life and you've been going in the opposite direction. Now, you know, I got to get on the same page with God, but also I got to be obedient to God. And the more I'm obedient to God, the more of his hand and his favor and his assistance will come upon me. Listen, you don't need to run from that. You are God's child. God loves you and cares for you. He loves to provide for you. What reasonable mother or father or grandparent or uncle doesn't or aunt doesn't want to give to a child in their family? And that's God's desire as we obey him. He will move in a great way. Let's change our thinking from convenience and let's move over to obedience. That is how we need to live. That is God's heart for you and I. And whatever Jordan we're facing that looks like a no way, God is gonna make it your highway and you're gonna walk through it and you're gonna be greater because of it because greater is God who is in you than he that is in this world. Choose obedience. And many times obedience will precede our own understanding of the situation. But just as God went ahead of the Israelites through the Ark of the Covenant, that was his presence. That was his, their Emmanuel, God with us. Just as God went ahead of them, listen to this, God is going ahead of you. And maybe that's the prayer right now. God, go ahead of me into this. God, go ahead of me into that. That's changing our thinking right now. Instead of thinking it can't be done, we're going, God, your will be done. If this is your will, oh God, you're gonna make it happen. Lord, your will be done because, God, you're great, you're mighty, you're powerful. Change our thinking. Change our thinking from our will to be done to God's will to be done. See, our will to be done is to be scared and run away. That's the page we want to be on. We're we're there to go, look how big the ocean is. Uh, Look look at the ocean, look at the undergrowth. How am I going to go? You know, forget about the water killing them. The undergrowth would have tripped them. We need to step forward in faith right now and trust God. Regardless of what we see, we got to step forward. You know, I was in the ocean over the summer and um, I was scaring everybody in my family because I went far out and I came across this one part where I stepped and, and you swooped down and there was all undergrowth there. Now I'm, I'm about 5'11", depending on what hairspray I use that day, but, but I, I was completely submerged under the water. And then when I was trying to gain traction, when I got to the bottom, my legs were getting caught up in the undergrowth. I'm sure all of those elements concern the Israelites. But God told them what to do and they did it. What do we need to do today? Let's change our thinking from convenience. That's my will be done to obedience. Your will be done. You might want to jot this last principle down. In light of all of this, focus on the big picture of heaven. Focus on the big picture of heaven. You know, if you're going to pray your kingdom come, your will be done not on earth as it is in where? In heaven. What's going on in heaven right now? God's will is being done. God's will is being done perfectly. That's why the last part of Matthew 6, 10 says, as it is in heaven, just as the angels are worshiping God, just as all believers who have died ahead of us are giving honor to God. God's rule and his reign is happening without interruption, without backtalk, without people trying to go on their own page. That's what we're praying. God, rule in my life. God, this is the cooperative principle at its heart. God, the same way you rule in heaven, rule in my life, rule in my home, rule over my job, rule over my dreams. I mean, how many years have we wasted going our own direction, uh, chasing our own way, going in the opposite direction like Jonah did? We need to be like Joshua and those priests, and we need to step in the water. And as we do that, we want to focus on the big picture of heaven, that this isn't all there is, that we are going to do God's will uh, because God tells us to, but also because God's got a bigger plan than this world, that we want him to reign as he does in heaven and that our citizenship is not here. See, when we live according to our will, when we stay stuck on our page, when we choose to think on convenience over obedience, you know what the problem is? Is we're just living for this world. And some of you who are listening right now, you, you're thinking, oh, I gotta just gain this and I gotta gain that. You know, Jesus said, what good is if you gain the whole world but you lose your soul? 
So you need the Son of God to save you. You need Jesus Christ. That's the page you need to be on with the cross. And as you give your heart to that, you focus on the big picture that God has promised me eternity, that we're just passing through, that our citizenship is in heaven. That was uh, made clear to me. I was reminded again, as last week, uh, one of our dear members, which you'll see her picture for those who are able to watch, Herrera Javid, who went home to be with the Lord. At six months of age, Herrera was stricken with polio. She didn't have a wheelchair in India. She got around on her hands. And then later on, she would get a wheelchair. And for those of you who come to church regularly, um, to, to my left from the stage in the altar, you would always see Herrera in the back in her wheelchair. And I have fond memories of her. She'd come up after service and I kneeled down before her and she would pray over me. And that's what she was known for. She was a prayer warrior. And she would put her hands on my hair. And I tell her, please don't press too down. I got another service, but she didn't care. She'd press down and she'd, she'd pray a blessing over me. I remember going to her house and having doing taking communion to her with Joseph years ago, and that became a, a regular thing that we did. I'm going to miss not being able to do that now. But she never had the joy of walking. But a thought swept over my mind when I spoke to Mr. and Mrs. Christian that, um, that their beloved sister had went home to be with the Lord. A thought came over me that gave great comfort that, that really helps me to understand that there are times I don't understand God's will, but this part I do is that right now, Herrera doesn't need a wheelchair. She's walking and she's skipping and she's running and she's dancing and she's enjoying the presence of God in heaven. And she'll be able to do that for all of eternity. The best way to pray is to always be heavenly minded. The Bible tells us, don't set your mind on just the things here. Set your mind on things above the things to come, heaven. And when you pray that way, there's a certain boldness that you have, a conviction to stay on the right page, a desire to be obedient, not just convenient. Focus on the big picture of heaven, that God is on his throne. That's where the grace flows from. And although there are many things in this life that do not make sense to us, even as we go through this valley of the virus, we know the promise of God that we will not fear any death because God is with us. God will deliver us. And one day he'll give us the ultimate deliverance because of the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus Christ, which is eternal life in heaven, which our dear sister is enjoying right now. And we have that hope to look forward to because our citizenship is not here, it is is in heaven. And so God says to all of us, come let us reason together. Though your sins are like scholar, I will make you white as snow. Look at the big picture of heaven, that our home is not here, it's heaven. Pray like that. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we'll be able to say like the apostle Paul in Philippians 3.20, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we eagerly waiting for him to return as savior, the second coming of Christ. Until that time, my friends, as believers, we wanna live for the glory of God. If God takes us out of this world via the rapture or we die of natural causes, however it's going to be, that is ancillary. What is primary? is that we live a life in cooperation with God Almighty till the day he calls us home. And by doing so, we will be pushing away that resistive spirit and we will be living a life that is inviting the blessing, the approval, the endorsement, and the assistance of God. No better way to live. Our sister Herrera is living in the reality of these promises now. Let's get on the same page with God now. Let's not wait anymore. Let's be obedient till the Lord calls us home and let's consider the backdrop of heaven and let us keep our eyes fixed on those beautiful truths that our citizenship is not here, but it's in heaven to come because of Jesus Christ and the work he did on the cross and that empty tomb in Jerusalem. May God bless you. May you receive these truths. May you stand on them and may the promises of God, may this prayer, this cooperative prayer, help you to come to God's throne of grace with boldness, confidently knowing 
that God is willing and able to part your Red Sea, your Jordan, and bring incredible blessings. Because you know what? Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven, waiting for you and I to live this and pray this cooperative life before him. To God be the glory for the Jordans that he's enabled you to cross in the past and for the ones to come. May God bless you. Let's pray together. With all of our heads bowed and eyes closed, we want to give you an opportunity to get on the same page with God. If you've never asked Christ into your heart or if you need to just recommit your life to God, I want to invite that first group who needs Christ to pray this prayer. Just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins and rose from the dead. I repent of my ways. I trust in Jesus. Grant me forgiveness and eternal life. With all of your heads bowed and eyes closed, let me just pray for those who want to just recommit their life uh, to Christ. Our Father and our God, we rededicate our lives to you. We want your will to be done. We want your kingdom to come. We want your reign to be in our home and in our life. We submit these prayers and sow them now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.
his faithfulness. Have a blessed day. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, we always count it a privilege to spend time with you. Uh, we pray that today's service uh, was a blessing and an encouragement. I want to remind you of some important ways to remain connected. Uh, we've been telling you each week about the prayer card. Go ahead and submit that. We have links for you um, and just a great way for you to just stay connected to the church uh, via prayers for your family, especially for first responders that you might know or those who are in the medical field, those on the front lines. Um, let's be praying together as a church. We don't need to gather at the church to do that. We could do that from our home, uh, but let's be on the same page and let's, uh, let's put those prayer requests in. We also want to remind you about the connection card. If you're a guest for the first, second, or third time, go ahead and fill that out. Or if you just want to let us know you were here and check in and say me and my family are watching and tuning in, uh, that's just a great way for the church uh, to know who's, who's watching, who's listening. You know, it's hard to keep track of it all through the church app and other ways. And so this is just a way for you to remain connected. I also want to remind you of our Crossroads help page. You can go to our website and that's a way for you to find out ways that you can contribute as well as uh, see if there's areas where those who might have needs. And so if you have a need, you could let us know that on that page. And um, as, the, as the days go by, uh, we'll find ways to meet those needs. Um, but we, we want to do this as a way of just uh, surveying the congregation. Um, so those who want to give help and those who might need help. And so take advantage of that page. And as we mentioned, uh, you could give as we continue to service and care for the NYPD and the EMS workers with providing food for them. Um, these are all small contributions that we can make uh, just to bless those. And of course, let's keep in prayer. And I challenge you with this message today with the cooperation principle. I'm going to tell you it's not easy, but by God's grace, we could do it. Let's live a life um, where we are inviting God's assistance, not pushing him away with resistance. Let's be people who are uh, diligently praying and seeking God, especially now through all that we're going. And so with that said, know that we miss you and love you, and we ask for God's continued blessing to be upon you. Thank you.